don't let one hurt you when it comes down to that. It's like, all right, well, that didn't work out. There's, there's plenty of other. Exactly. You know, it's easy to say that, but yeah, ultimately you gotta, you gotta adopt that mindset that don't put all your eggs in that one basket that it, you know, doesn't, doesn't work. And you put yourself out there, like don't beat yourself up for it. Just, you know, find somebody else you can make a better connection with and, and you'll, uh, you'll definitely go places, you know? What's going on guys. Welcome to the creating wealth podcast where I, Kyle from Kyle Curtin real estate interview local top dogs in the real estate investing, wealth building and personal finance industries. Let's build together. What's up, guys? We have a very inspiring, super local guest on this week's episode of the podcast. Dan is constantly in the real estate space, be it through his multiple different investments or even his W-2 job. In yet another two-part, crazy, information-filled episode, we get the awesome opportunity to chat about a ton of really great, super helpful tips for anyone at any part of their real estate investing journey. In the second part of this interview, we get to talk about some pretty interesting topics from tips for jumping into real estate investing as an introvert, the power of mastermind groups, and finding the part of your business that you really enjoy doing. There is so much value to take from this episode and I hope you enjoy. Let's jump right into the episode. I haven't actually been a part of any like masterminds either yet, but like it sounds pretty cool. I mean, like I've been to like like meetups, like networking things that are like a bunch of different, you know, industries and like, you know, kind of local like to us or whatever. Like, you know, there's like anywhere from like insurance to, you know, people owning like small side businesses and stuff like that. And I, it's pretty interesting, you know, to your point of like, if you have something that you're dealing with to see like a completely fresh perspective, then just bringing that, um, you know, say it was like a real estate investing, like type of problem to bring that type of problem to like a whole fresh new set of eyes, you know, that isn't yeah. normally in this can prove to be pretty powerful, you know, and yeah. like you, you never know. You know what I mean? Yeah, it can all... launch you. You can launch you into a world that you're not even aware exists. Launch you up into a cloud that you're like, holy smokes. I didn't realize that I had this ceiling and I didn't know. And then you get into that level. It's like, oh no, these are there's a whole different world out there. But again, I mean, you you talk to a you talk to a contractor, and a contractor is going to give you a, a different way of getting to a solution than if you talk to a to a, a I don't know think of anything you want a school teacher is going to have a different yeah. way of teaching how to do it and somebody that owns a McDonald's is going to have a different way of teaching you because it's all they all have different motivations and, and different business uh, foundations but um, there's value to everything because everyone's gotten where they're at by building their own foundation so there's everyone has value to add it's just a matter of taking the bits and pieces that you you can't think of on your own because you're not in that mindset you get that tunnel vision it's like no 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 this is how I know everybody does it it's like well a biotech guy doesn't do it that way because he doesn't have the same type of problem, but his problem might be framed a little bit differently and could be presented a little differently. And then you deal with the, a doctor. I mean, a doctor might tell you something, Hey, this is how she's dealing with this. And it's like, Holy smokes. Like that is way <laughs> upper level thinking. I wasn't thinking about that, but is it takes a lot of brain energy to, to get to, you know, get to these levels and they all have things that you don't even consider it. You know, it might be valuable, but, that's why I think some of those masterminds that are very eclectic, you know, made up of a mix of industries, um, definitely help you in a different way. But if you're really focused on real estate investing, then getting around more real estate investors that kind of help you build that foundation. And then when you get more into the business mindset of how do you grow this as a business, that's where the other industries might benefit you. Yeah. Even like just to make you more well-rounded, you know, in like the whole business atmosphere. Like there are going to be, you know, some businesses that are a lot more like, you know, B2B, like just business to business. Like this is how I go about like relationships with this kind of person versus like, you know, relationships in like a business to consumer, like just a regular, you know, like owner to a customer type of thing. Yeah. You know, I'm like, if you go to like a completely different industry, like we're going to see that one way. And they're going to be like, oh, like, why the hell are you doing it that way? <laughs> you know, yeah. like, this is how I've been doing it. Like, it's super streamlined. And yeah, like, the, there's so much power in just kind of getting like as much information from like, as many different places as you can. Or even like, um, 
I've heard it referred like the same kind of concept. Um, just kind of like the kind of content that you consume, you know, like if real estate investing is your thing, like phenomenal, like, you know, there are a lot of us out there, like bigger pockets, podcasts and books and whatever, but also, you know, reading those books and like listening to those audio books and podcasts and stuff for things that are like completely different, even like other, um, other topics in business, you know, like just all together, like, I, I don't know, like just throwing one out there that's not really real estate related i think it's called like how i built this it's uh you know like a smaller podcast of like um you know people that like just own businesses and stuff and how they built them and like you know maybe just hearing something that's like similar to your industry or like has similar qualities but in a completely separate environment might help you like exponentially you know because like you might pick up like one or two nuggets from that like oh oh my god like you know, this is how they do it in this industry. Like, this is how I can translate that to be applied to my problem. You know, like, just- right. yeah, sometimes you don't know where that bridge is. You know what exactly. I mean? And, and I'm reminded of um, when I spoke at the meetup in Lowell, um, after the meetup, I, I caught up with, uh, with a couple of people and we were talking. And uh, one of the, one of the guys I was talking to is uh, he's in the accounting world, uh, but he wants to get into investment. Yeah. Um, and he's just like, yeah, I just don't see the connection, everything like that. And so I, I, I mentioned, I said, well, you know, you're on the accounting side. So you're an important aspect of the proper way to like invest in real estate. And I said, so look at it in the framework of a big investment deal, right? If you're doing accounting on a big investment, a, a big syndication or something like that, or, or maybe you're helping on the property management side, let's say, accounting is a crucial role there where you're trying to identify what's above the line and what's below the line. Yeah. Because that impacts your net operating income for reporting reasons. And, you know, when you're doing capital work that has to be depreciated, when you're doing cost segregation studies, things like that, you're critical to that role to tell them, hey, you know, this $5,000 that you did up here, that's technically repair and maintenance. So that's going to hit your expense line. So are you budgeted for that or not? And that helps build your expense budget over the course of a year versus, hey, you need a new roof. That's going to be $40,000. Um, but it's depreciable. It's, it's a capital replacement. So you get to put that below the line. It doesn't hurt your expenses on a net operating income uh, presentation, but you have to now depreciate that on the schedule that you have doing cost segregation. So when I mentioned that, he's like, I never thought about it like that. And I'm like, that's, I didn't know where that conversation was going, but just seeing the light bulb go off in his head. And I'm like, okay, that's a bridge. That's the bridge you needed to connect what you do on a day to day to real estate investing. And now you know what I have is an asset to this industry. Um, and you just reframe how you're looking at things to that regard. And it's like, all right, I get it now. Like this, this is going to be beneficial. And then you just build off of that. Exactly, man. Even like, like everybody's going to jump into it at a different spot. You know, and like what I mean by that is like, even, you know, like you, like you, you know, we're heavy in that construction world and like, you know, you wanted to get into real estate and stuff. And that like you got into that, you know, with that like huge construction, you know, type of background. So like you're able to, you know, be walking through a house and be like, dude, like this is literally like, you know, three or four things that I see here that like aren't really looking too hot. But somebody else who comes in from, you know, that accounting background is going to know how the numbers kick ass, but they're not going to see that through the angle that you did, you know, from seeing like certain structural stuff. And eventually you know, just from learning and stuff, like you guys are going to meet in the middle and have like that baseline knowledge either way. But like, you know, jumping in from the construction piece has, a, you know, a ton of value, but jumping in the, uh, what's it called? Accounting piece also has a ton of value. So it's just right. a matter of, I feel like it's just kind of finding like your value spot in like basically how you can bring, um, like what you can bring to the table pretty much like coming in. You know, yeah. like just that's that's what I love about real estate, man, is like, you know, everybody's like so been so supportive and everything at like whatever point you're at that, like, you know, exactly. You know, if you have the benefit of being an accountant, like, you know, you're able to give value from that portion as well as like from the construction side or like, I don't know, if you're like an insurance guy or like, right. Or, you know, an elect- or, yeah, like an electrician or I don't know, <laughs> you know, and it's, it's multifaceted. Yeah, there's there's value. It's not just like you have to be a good surgeon. You know what I mean? You have to be a good uh, x-ray technician or something like that. Like there's, it's a whole 
build like a whole industry of different traits and different skills that benefit you in this in this world to be good at it. and that kind of puts you into that mindset of you can't I mean, I, I've always been one of those guys that, you know, I'm not great at networking, right? So um, I'm more of an introvert. So going to networking events and things like that was always a bit of a struggle for me. I feel uh, you, but man. when I realized <laughs> that it's, it's not, you go to one of these meetings and I, I know you've seen it. it, like somebody goes to their very first networking meeting and that's the last time you see them. That's it. You're right. Because You're right. They, they walked into the room thinking this is the, this is the silver bullet. This is the golden ticket. I'm going to go to network. I'm going to meet this person who's just going to let me ride their coattails to the finish line. And I'm going to make millions of dollars Yeah. Um, for, for people like me who are more introverted and not great at networking. It's, it's more the repetition, right? Yeah. So going over and over and over again and committing yourself to, to be a face that is familiar in that environment, because sometimes first impressions are not great. I, I do not make a good first impression and I know it. I feel it's, you, man. <laughs> it's, something, it's something I've struggled with my whole life. I get it. Um, people think I'm unapproachable and I'm I'm uh, I'm too serious and all that stuff. But I'm 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 very I'm very in my head, right? Yeah. Um, so going over and over to these events uh, starts to break that ice. I I have a thick layer of ice, so I have to go over and over again to get comfortable and. Um, and then again, people start to recognize you and then people start to come up to you and they're like, Hey, I've seen you at the last 15 meetups. And it's like, I've heard you talk to this guy about that and this guy to that. So it helps. Right. But, um, you know, you have to kind of know that you're not good at everything. You're not going to be good at everything. And I had to get into that mindset of, I'm not a good salesperson. I'm not good at networking, let's say. So I'm never going to be good at real estate investing. Right. Cause it's all, it's a people business really. But it really comes down to, okay, I'm, I'm not good at that. And I could work really, really hard at getting better at that. Or I can align myself with people that are good at that stuff. And I'm good at the other stuff. And that's where it gets more into the partnership side. And my past partnerships that I've had have not necessarily gone swimmingly. Mm -hmm. uh, for one reason or another, they've kind of failed where I put in a little too much and I end up carrying all the weight and then something ends up falling apart and I just end up the last one holding the bag. Um, yeah, yeah. So I'm nervous getting into more partnerships going forward just because I don't want it to blow up in my face because of that. But when you go to these types of events and you start to see the people um, and really doing your due diligence on a partner, you know what I mean? Um, that's where it really comes down to is uh, my most recent business partner. We're, we're in the uh, similar circle of, of friends uh, up in Pelham. We both have kids that played soccer together. So we have other ties and other connections that um, kind of, we know each other outside of the real estate world. Yeah. And we know that we're good people, right? He's good people. Um, and I know that at the end of the day, there's, there's benefit to partnering with him uh, to that regard. But that's why finding those other people to partner with is something that I'm struggling with and I'm trying to focus on getting better at uh, because I can't do it alone. Right. Um, I'm not going to be able to put the effort into learning how to do everything myself and doing it myself and riding solo forever is not conducive to hitting the goals that I want to hit, um, you know, before retirement, I could hit all these goals. Sure. It might, it might take me a hundred years, um, <laughs> at the pace I'm going, but, uh, yeah, definitely aligning yourself with the right people and being open to the right type of partnerships, uh, I think would help so that you don't take it all on yourself. Yeah. I feel that, Dan. Literally, like all of that. <laughs> I'm definitely more on the the introverted side as well. You know, like so, like going to like even like that first meetup. You know what I mean? It's like I, I remember like I, I avoided it for a while. I was like, oh, I kind of want to go. Like it'll really help me, but nah. <laughs> you know what I mean? And it's like that's a point that I really want to make, guys. Is like it's it's not easy. You know what I mean? Like especially you know if you're more on the like the introverted. Um, side of things and like you know just going in there and like you don't know anybody like you know you just at, at least the way that i felt you know it was basically like you know that you'd kind of get swallowed up you know all these guys in like one of these meetups have like you know a million dollars and like you know who's this kid that's just waddling in here like you know that looks for i don't know like this thing's kind of cool whatever and uh you know nobody's gonna want to talk to me and like this that the other and that's something that I discovered is like, most of that is all in your head. Like it's, yeah. it's like a, oh, what's the phrase? It's, it's like self something. Um, 
self-sabotage yeah pretty much you know so like it's most of it like most of it's in your head and like especially in at least from what i've seen you know in, in the real estate investing space is like you know most people are out there to sincerely help each other out you know not to like rip each other down well you know at least what i've seen <laughs> but we might just have a really good uh good group but um anyway um yeah, you know, I mean, like, just from what I've seen is like 99.9% of people like just really want to see each other succeed. And like are willing to have those kind of conversations with pretty much anybody, you know, and, like, right. even if even if you could just, you know, have that one conversation, you know, with somebody like talk to one person in there, you know, like even like just shoot the breeze, like just to kind of dip your toes in. And then, right. you know, maybe the next meetup, like talk to a couple more people. And like, you know, it's it's just one of those things like, you know, it's, it's not going to come right away, you know, but even like one thing that's crazy is like even having one single conversation or like even like one sentence can like totally change your life and like everything. You know what I mean? Like, it's crazy. Like you never know. And it's, I remember there was um the first meetup that I went to was a couple years ago and it was, you know, just like this really small, um small, uh, what's it called? pretty much like a, just a small, like business meetup kind of thing. It was in like a, a coffee shop in um, Charlestown. And uh, basically, you know, I didn't really know what I was walking into and like, I, you know, brought business cards and everything, like, you know, thinking I'm going to like get clients from this and stuff and didn't end up happening. But basically like what it was, was um so Robert Kiyosaki, you know, for you guys who don't know, which is probably few and far between, <laughs> he, um, you know, he, he wrote a book called Rich Dad, Poor Dad, wrote a bunch of books, did a bunch of cool stuff. Um, but he has a board game um, called uh, Cashflow. And it's yeah. basically, it's kind of like a Monopoly where, well, it plays like a Monopoly, but basically like you take a role and what that role is, is like an occupation. So it's, it's kind of meant to like simulate real life. So like one person, you know, your, um, you know, like quote unquote occupation, like that you'll be playing in the game is like a police officer. And one of them's like, I, I don't know, like a gardener or something, you know what I mean? And like, they all have different wages and like different qualities, per, like pluses, minuses and everything. And it's meant to kind of simulate real life. And basically like, you know, there was probably like 10 of us there and the woman running it, uh, her name's Lisa, shout out to Lisa. <laughs> um, you know, just from, um, just from like playing through this game and like learning how to play like it just it was it was a ton of fun you know and like you just kind of get to know people that are are like minded and like it's just a fun atmosphere and like nobody's trying to like you know rip each other down or like do like all this crazy like business like nonsense and you know it's it was just a helpful thing you know like we're all kind of learning something together and like literally just from that first meetup like it totally changed my life altogether like meet meeting um lisa is you know was one of the the biggest things that that totally got me jump started you know on a different path um you know from just kind of tradition but basically you know what i'm getting at is like even if you go to like one meetup like talking to one person like it can like totally throw you a curveball in another direction that like you totally didn't expect you know and like just like if you can push yourself to have like one conversation even like once in a while like everything can change you know, and like, once you see it once, you know, you, you just want to keep getting more and more of it. Like it's, you know, <laughs> you know, it's, you never know, you know what I mean? It's, and like most people want to help each other out, you know? So it's like, it's, it's more just kind of, um, you know, just kind of in your head. And like, as you keep going to these events, you know, like you said, Dan, like just getting those repetitions, like, I feel like, you know, your defenses for something like that just kind of start to break down, you know, and like, you just kind of are able to, to be more of just a person like, Oh, you know, let me go talk to these guys. Like, you know, this guy looks cool. Like let's talk. And like, you just, you kind of get more like open up a little bit more. Cause like, it's, you know, you, you start to realize that it's not actually what you thought it was in your head, you know, and right. you just, you never know. Yeah. <laughs> it's true. It's very true. I mean, I heard on a prior podcast, you were like, I, I want to get into a room and uh, have a bunch of real estate investors play monopoly together. Yeah. Um, <laughs> You know? And I mean, I, it's funny you bring up the cash flow game. I mean, I, I've had the cash flow game on my, my wish list for forever, yeah. but it's one of those things where it's like, yeah, even if I got it, like the, the people in my immediate network, right. They're just, they're not that interested in that type of thing. So I started looking online and there were 
I didn't realize there's actually groups like you just mentioned that you yeah. were part of a group that people met together and did that. Um, and I found cash flow online. There's an online version that I was like, oh, let's play it and see what this is all about. Yeah. Um, and it's funny because I actually just uh, I have cash flow for kids. And wow. my uh, my oldest daughter is now six. And uh, six is like the they recommend kids no younger than six start playing. And so I was like, hey, my my daughter's six now. We're going to crack open the cash flow for kids game. So we actually started playing that. And I'm trying to teach her a little bit about the assets and liabilities. So I just think it's cool. It's it's you know, it's helpful in that regard. But like you said, in, in that environment, it's an icebreaker, really, is exactly. what it comes down to. You know what I mean? So if you do find yourself more of the introverted and, um, you know, kind of reserved uh, mannerisms, then environments like that, where there's a an easier icebreaker might make more sense. Whereas you go to a, a big network event and uh, the loudest person in the room doesn't isn't necessarily the best networker. It's just that's their personality. I mean, <laughs> the quietest person in the room is taking in all the information that's being presented mm -hmm. and is going to be positioned in a way to make uh, it's going to take longer, but could make more genuine connections um, a little bit easier uh, on that front. Whereas the people that are just working the whole room, they can make connections with everyone and then become they become a hub. Right. They're like, oh, I know this guy and I know that guy. And that's great. Uh, but that's intimidating to somebody who has like a, an introverted personality. They're like, oh, I don't I don't want to be that yeah, guy. Yeah. I don't want to be the loudest one. I don't want to be the center of attention. Um, but I do have something to offer. So that's why you have to lean more on making one on one connections and making more genuine connections um, like that. And not just giving out business cards. Exactly. Even though business cards is great. I mean, we bought business cards for a reason, right? We got <laughs> to hand them out. We're not doing anybody any good sitting in the box, but, yeah. um, you know, definitely making those, making those connections and staying in touch with those people um, and just checking in on them. And, and you create your own little network of, of uh, you know, your own little mastermind in a sense. You know what I mean? Pretty much. Yeah. There's, um, I read, uh, I'm not sure if you read it, Dan. I, I really like this book. It was the uh, Millionaire Real Estate Investor. By, I uh, I one of the books yeah. I would have recommended at the end of this thing. Yeah. Totally, man. So yeah. there's um a graph in the, I forget where it is in the book. It's, I don't know, probably like halfway through, but it's the um the millionaire real estate investor, like circle, like network. And like, yeah. guys, literally like I printed this thing out and put it on the wall. And like, it's, it's like the craziest thing in the world. So basically what it is, you know, for like those people who haven't read the book, is there's like three rings and it's basically like everybody on your team like it shows all the different roles with like you know a couple different circles like that get smaller and smaller and what it is is like your people on the outside would be like you know like contractors like you know electricians roofers plumbers um insurance people i don't know why i keep thinking of insurance people today but whatever and then like on your inner ring are going to be people who are even closer to you and like, I, I forget what those ones were, maybe like lenders, um, maybe attorneys, something like that. I forget. I have to kind of look at it again. And then there's like your very, very inner circle. So that's like mentors, um, you know, and like basically kind of like your go to people, uh, maybe like inspectors. I don't know. I, I have to look at it again. But anyways, so basically like that, it's just proved to be so powerful. Cause you can literally look at the ring and be like, Oh, you know, do I know any painters? Do I know any electricians? Do I know attorneys? Like, who do I not know here? And like, how do I fill in those positions? Right. And it, like, I actually, I made um, like an Excel spreadsheet version of it and just basically took all of those, um, put yeah, took all of those roles and put them on the spreadsheet. And now you can see like, Oh, like, I don't know any painters. Like, how do I go out and meet painters? Like for when I need them, you know, and like, you can just kind of see, or, uh, you know, somebody way back when, uh, shout out to Nate Swift, he, um, I interviewed him on the podcast in like the very, very beginning. And I'll never forget something that he said. And it was basically referring to your team as uh, like a football team. So like you have your first line, you know, you got like your loan officer, your attorney, your inspector, like your agent, your, you know, this, that, the other, like these are all your go-to people. Now, when these guys aren't around, you know, you're going to want somebody to be able to sub in when these guys aren't there and have like another go to guy, you know, so like you're always like moving down the field and like, you know, scoring those touchdowns and stuff. And like, it's, I don't know, you know, and like, I feel like in kind of today's day and age, like, you know, through social media, especially like Instagram, LinkedIn, like bigger pockets, like, 
you know, going to network and events and stuff. Like it's, I feel like it's never really been, well, we've never really had as much potential uh, like as we do now, I guess you could say like with the internet and stuff, um, you know, just to be able to reach out to people and, and kind of build that team. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> But yeah, you know, it's even um, to kind of go into like a different, different neck of the woods, like even if you don't start off with like going to like, you know, meetups and stuff like that, even if you just reach out to people on, you know, like Instagram or Facebook or something, you know, like you see like, I don't know, like an investor that's in like your town or like a town close to yours. And, you know, just reach out to them and be like, hey, you know, like, I love what you're doing. Like, you know, would you maybe want to hop on a phone call and like shoot the breeze? Like, I'm just starting to get into things. And, you know, like, like I said earlier, like 99% of people are, are going to want to help. And if they don't, screw it. Like, just keep moving on, you know, and th there's a lot of people right. out there that, that you can meet. Yeah, exactly. You know, and don't, and, let, don't let one hurt you when it comes down to that. It's like, all right, well, that didn't work out. There's, there's plenty of other. Exactly. You know, it's easy to say that, but yeah, ultimately you gotta, you gotta adopt that mindset that don't put all your eggs in that one basket that it, you know, doesn't, doesn't work. And you put yourself out there, like, don't beat yourself up for it. Just, you know, find somebody else you can make a better connection with and, and you'll, uh, you'll definitely go places, you know? Exactly. Yeah. It's, you know, even like, if you just kind of start small, like just going to like that one meetup, like talking to like one person or a couple people, or, you know, reaching out to like five people on bigger pockets or something, sending them a message or just like start small, you know, because it's, yeah. it, it's definitely pretty scary starting off, you know, and right. but once you start to get into it a little bit more and get those repetitions in it, it gets a whole lot easier. <laughs> yep. Absolutely. Yeah. So, Mr. Dan, um, what is the most important lesson that you have learned over your career? If you had to. <laughs> Most important lesson. Yeah. Uh, Some of these questions are, are a little tough. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's not a yes or no, right? So it's, it's, made, it's made to make you think. Um, you know, the most important lesson is, I would say, re in recent, right, recent times, yeah. I've been involved in real estate for um, a few years now. Like I said, I bought that property in Lowell in 2009. Um, mm -hmm. I was involved a few years before that. And uh, here we are in 2021. Um, and from 2009 to 2020, um, on an investment level, I only made like one deal happen. And it was really just because I, I, you know, put the foot on the gas a little bit more and recommitted to this avenue in 2020. Yeah. Um, and you know, I probably started getting a little heavier in, uh, in February, uh, of 2020. And by December I had a deal. Um, so I would say just from that, uh, the biggest lesson that I had learned is getting over that analysis, uh, paralysis by analysis, um, was that you don't need all of the answers, right? You don't need it all. You get 80% and you go, right? I mean, you, You've gone through enough of it. Do the reps, get that done. Um, don't just pull the trigger on your very first, very first deal and not expect something to go wrong. It, yeah. By all means, go hard at your first deal, but have a cushion, have a big cushion if it's your first deal. Um, otherwise, put in the reps. Go to every open house you can put your hands on. You know what I mean? See them all. They're open. Walk them. You know what I mean? The more houses you look at, the more things are going to start to click. And if you want, bring a vendor with you, you know, bring a contractor with you, take him out to lunch or, or pay him for his time and just say, just come walk the house with me. I'll pay you afterwards. I just want to sit down and talk about what your thoughts are so I can help start putting budgets together so that when you walk the next property on your own, you're not there. So it really comes down to take the action, right? Don't be afraid to take the action without all the information. You don't need every bit of information to pull the trigger. You need enough information to make sure that you're protected and go and surround yourself with the right people. I mean, if, if I was going to put myself in a position where I'd hurt myself, I know that the team of realtors I surround myself with um, would, they wouldn't talk me out of something, but they would ask those probing questions to make sure, are you certain you want to do this? You know what I mean? Like I've been around the business long enough and I've seen that. So based on my experience, do you really want to pull the trigger on this? Uh, and take those risks. And, you know, that kind of is the, the canary in the mind. You know what I mean? It's like, oh, okay, I, I'm missing something here. Um, 
but yeah, just don't, don't wait to take the action. Uh, that's something that I had to really struggle with and, uh, and I've gotten over finally. Um, now I just run my numbers. If the numbers work, send an offer. That's, yep. that's the end of the day. Don't, don't overthink it. Send the offer and just go. You're right, man. That's huge. You know, and like, even like, that's pretty hard. Cause like, I'm kind of wired the same way and like starting to, you know, kind of get away from it, you know, a little bit more as time goes on, but like just wanting to have a lot of the answers, like before you jump in and like, literally like nothing happens, <laughs> you know, it's like, you find something wrong with everything and you're like, Oh my God, like, this is crazy. Like, you know, no way. But like the thing too, is like, when you go into a house, like it's going to have its problems. You know what I mean? And if it doesn't, like it probably got swallowed up already, <laughs> you know? And like the industry moves too fast. It, it moves. Exactly. If this is something that you really want to do, this industry moves too fast, especially right now mm -hmm. uh, to sit on the sidelines. If you want to do it, you're going to have to take risks, but put yourself in a position where you're not going to be homeless. If something goes wrong, right? Yeah. <laughs> only, only put in the game what you're willing to lose. And hopefully you don't, you don't pay that much of a lesson, but um you know, there are plenty of resources out there. You get yourself into a bind, talk to the resources that are out there. Talk to the, go to the networking things and be like, hey, everyone, I have this huge problem that just happened. Anybody have advice as to what I should do? And that would open up doors, you know what I mean? Or put it out on Facebook and everything like that. I mean, there's there's a lot of resources out there right now. Um, so take advantage of it. You know what I mean? You, you already have a bunch of safety nets in place even if you don't think about it. I mean, yeah. your network, your Facebook, your meetups, all those things, those are your safety nets. You know what I mean? If you put something together and you have the right realtor put you put you uh, your offer together, you're not going to hurt yourself. You know what I mean? Exactly. There's going to be at least one escape clause. If you're not 100% certain, there'll be at least one escape clause in your offer. Um, and your realtor hopefully, you know, will not let you get hurt on that deal. Exactly. Um, and you'll be able to pull out in worst case scenario, you pay a couple bucks for a lesson. Like you said before, you know, it might just be a home inspection and be like, oh, that's $700 was painful. Well, yeah, it's painful, but it could have cost you $50,000 if you didn't realize <laughs> that the, your walls were bowling out and falling apart right underneath you and you had no idea. So just take the risk. There's enough safety nets already in place. Even if you can't see them, they are there and just yeah. get the word out. You know what I mean? Your network will support you exactly man you know like even like there, there's so many safety nets like aside from like you know just out, like on paper you know and like yeah like you know in in your contracts and stuff you're 100 right you know like there's definitely going to be ways that you'll be able to to get out of that you know if xyz happens but also you know having that home inspection or even like like you said you know like if you wanted to you know depending on the situation like take the route of waiving a home inspection depending on you know how you how you want to do your thing but like if you are able to go into that property like with a contractor or something like you said you know or have like a lot of construction experience you, like you might feel a lot more comfortable like taking a risk like that but also right. you know if you see something that's going on like if you have the resources to to be able to get those questions answered you'll be all set you know, like, it, I feel like it's like, if you try to do like the whole thing alone, I feel like it's, you might be putting yourself in a bad situation, but the more you are, you're not, you, talk to, I mean, like, you don't, don't have to mince words. You are putting yourself in a yeah. bad position you're trying to do it by yeah. yourself. Yep. I can flat out admit that I could not do what I've done without the right team, right? Yeah, without but... good contractors, <laughs> without the right realtor, without the right attorney. You know what I mean? Like all of these people have bailed me out of situations or protected me from myself. So again, don't, you're not going to do it yourself. You can't knock on somebody's door. I mean, you could probably not a, many people that do this, but <laughs> knock on somebody's door with a briefcase full of money and say, I'd like to buy your house, yeah. hand them the briefcase and take the keys and walk away and you have yourself a deal, right? It doesn't work that way. Um, you can try, some, but we'll, some, we'll know how it goes. <laughs> right, some kind of piece of paper has to be put in place, right? And then it, it just, it takes steps from there. There's just, it's only logical that your attorney is going to have your best interest in mind. Your realtor is going to have your best interest in mind. Uh, and your contractors, you know what I mean? You are you run the risk with contractors and I get that. I mean, I've been in the trades. I've, I've, I've managed a lot of contractors. Um, but again, it really comes down to building rapport with them. You know what I mean? They're they're not there to provide slave labor. You know what I mean? They are there to provide their experience and their expertise and they need to be compensated for that. They've spent years developing their skill 
And they're now lending that skill to you because you don't have that skill or that time, right? And there's value to that. So, you know, YouTube is a wonder, you know what I mean? And, and I, I recommend anybody getting into any types of flips for the first time or anything like that. Um, the construction side of it is where a lot of stuff can can really develop and it just it gets scary that there's so much that can happen. Um, but if you bring in a good contractor and by good, I mean, you've got some references from them, right? Or you've, you've known other realtors or other investors or other people, fa friends, family, whatever that have used them successfully and they've been happy with them. Um, a quick Google search will tell you, oh God, the owner of that company just got arrested three months ago for embezzlement or something like that. It's like, right, <laughs> yeah. probably stay away from that person. <laughs> Um, you know, and look them up, see if they have their license. It's very easy to find out if a contractor has their license. Um, and it's obviously in everyone's best interest before you bring a contractor onto your site to ask for a certificate of insurance, make sure that they are insured and they're protected. Um, all of this just helps you. And then if you don't know how to change out cabinets, watch a YouTube video, take notes during the YouTube video. And then when you meet with your contractor, you at least know some of the terminology, you know some of the language, you know some of the questions to ask, um, but do not try to oversell it. A yeah. contractor is going to see right through you if you try to pretend that you know more about his business than he does, right? <laughs> that's, not, that's not a good way to, you don't, you don't get off on a good foot there. Um, yeah. <laughs> but again, I mean, you have, look at the people that are in, in your Facebook groups and things like that, that have done it and ask the questions. I mean, I've, I've yet to find a fellow investor that has not wanted to discuss or not wanted to help, right? I mean, yeah. it's it's that uh, scarcity mindset, right? People are like, oh, they're not going to help me because I'm going to be fighting for the same deals. There's a lot of deals out there, right? I mean, granted, I'd like a few more, but uh, they're, they're out there. Somebody's somebody's getting them. Somebody's buying these deals. Yeah. Um, but ask the questions. You know what I mean? Uh, people have been through what you've been through, and you know they'll help. They don't expect them to do the work for you. If you want that, you're going to pay for it, right? You're going to be paying for that mentor to hold your hands through every step of the way and, and go from there. And sometimes that has value. If you really feel that you are that scared, um, pay for somebody to be a part of their deal or something like that. Be like, can I project manage for you? And you may not get a big piece of the pie, but um, you get a little bit, great. But more importantly, you'll get the experience of being, you know, in the trenches with them. Exactly. Yeah. One thing that I wanted to stem on a little bit earlier, Dan, is like, you know, when it comes to, you know, like people that like try to kind of do everything on their own and like, that's, that's great and everything, but I feel like it's, it's like a huge waste of time to try to learn everything about everything. But so like pretty much instead going from trying to learn absolutely, you know, everything that there is to know about, you know, like structural stuff and like, um, you know, like the, the numbers and like debt to income and everything. Like, I feel like, you know, obviously learning a little bit about everything is, is, is great. Right. But like at the end of the day, you know, it makes more sense to be able to just find the people that do that 40 hours a week that are, that are experts at that, you know, then, you know, like you're going to get like kick-ass answers and like, yeah, exactly. You know, you're going to pay those people to access like their expertise, you know, that they've in turn paid for themselves. Like there's, there's no way in escaping it. You know what I mean? Like somebody's right. going to get paid for their knowledge. And if it's right. not you, then you have to find the guy that does, you know, right. like, just, and I mean, like, again, a lot of us, a lot of us do this because we want to enjoy what we do. Right. So at the end of the day, we want to look forward to it. Um, and I can tell you right now, I've always had that, that mindset of I'm going to do it myself. And I'm going to learn it. I'm going to figure it out or whatever. Um, but I will never be an expert at everything. It's just not possible. Right. So it's, and all it would end up doing is stressing me out and taking me away from the things that do bring me joy. Right. Um, I'm reminded of like the, it, it like flow theory, right. Where, when you start to get into your flow, into your groove, like time just melts away. You enjoy it. Nothing bothers you. And it's like, yeah, I, I this is what I, I meant. This is what I'm put on this earth to do. Right. Yeah. Um, and I remember like going through, uh, architecture school and we called the, they were charrettes, right? So you'd have a, a crit do where they would criticize your drawings. You do a, a critique of, uh, of your plans, your design or whatever you were working on that, that, you know, semester or whatever. And it, it was, it was very common that, uh, students would go through 24 hours straight, no sleep, 
just straight design work where you just go, go, go. And there are times I still do that because I still do some CAD design on the side um, where, you know, uh, for myself or for friends, family, whatever they're like, or somebody, another investor was like, hey, I really want to get a floor plan together for this. Fine, I'll, I'll whip up a floor plan for you. And time can just melt away on when you're doing things like that. Or when I'm running numbers, I can just lose track of time and I'll be like eight hours in and I'm like, oh my God, like I forgot to eat. I forgot to do it. Like, <laughs> but you enjoy it, right? You walk yeah. away with this, with this calm, with this peace. Um, so if you try to take on the stuff that you're not good at, you're forcing it. Like you're swimming Crazy. upstream. It's, it's not going to be easy for you. So why, why put yourself through all of that angst of doing the things that you really don't get enjoyment out of um, at your own detriment? You know what I mean? It's, find the people that enjoy that right and and you're all swimming downstream together and you're just like yeah you you'll work wonders when you start to really realize that is you know you don't have to do it all find the people that enjoy doing the stuff that you don't enjoy doing and and work with them you know it'll make your life easier and you're working on what makes you happy more and uh you know that ultimately is the freedom and the wealth that we're looking for is that freedom of time freedom of choice yeah it's huge man it really is you know and even um have you read the E Myth by any chance? Yes. All right. Yep. Perfect. So, guys, in in this book uh, called the E Myth, I think it's Michael Gerber. I think I forget. I don't know. But yep. anyway, check it out. Um, but basically, like one thing, you know, to to Dan's point is like there was a story in there about this lady and she wanted to open up like a pie shop, you know, like baking pies and that type of thing. And uh, you know, things were going great for a very short amount of time, you know, because she was like baking the pies and you know she was like a one-woman show like she was baking everything she was trying to like run the the front desk or whatever like greeting people you know like ordering the inventory literally like everything all together went to her and like you know everything was kind of going to crap you know for for lack of a better term and like she soon started to hate it you know and like this was her thing like baking pies was like her thing like that's you know this is what she wanted to do but she soon realized that the way that she would be able to do what she wanted to do is to hire people for those roles that she didn't want to do or like to do a lot less, you know, cause then she can like just focus on like, you know, like if she, you know, liked bacon or like, let's say that that was kind of her thing. So, you know, instead of like trying to run the front desk, like hiring somebody to, to run the front desk and, you know, manage the people and greet the people and like order the inventory, so now like everything's all off of her plate and she just has to focus on the thing that she loves and like sustainably it's, it's going to be, you know, a hell of a lot better because she's going to be a lot happier, like, you know, eight hours a day and like, you know, but trying to run around, you know, and do absolutely everything in your business yourself, you're probably going to hate it, you know, because like, there's going to be parts of parts of what you do, whether it's real estate investing or it's starting, you know, a, a bacon company or something there are going to be parts of it that you don't like, you know, unless there's like people out there that absolutely love everything, in which case, like, I'd love to have a conversation. <laughs> but I mean, you know, the vast majority of the time, like you're, you're not going to like every single part of your business. And like reading in that book, like, totally got me thinking like that was like a, like a punch in the face, you know, into the next, like, a different mindset, I guess you could say was like, yeah, you know, trying to build this independent or build this business like super independently and like how you want it is phenomenal. But in order to stay happy with it, like you have to find the part that actually, you know, you enjoy doing like sustainably, like all the time, because the other parts of it, you're either not gonna like as much as that one thing, or you're absolutely gonna hate it and it's gonna suck and like, you don't wanna do it. And like just hiring people to do that um, or, you know, figuring out ways to streamline it. But basically like bottom of the line is like somehow figuring out a way to get that done, but taking it off your plate, you know, so you can actually just enjoy the things that, that you like doing the most, you know, and kind of going from there. That book Absolutely. was crazy. I love it. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's a lot, there's a lot of books out there that, uh, you know, I've, in high school, I didn't like it. I didn't like reading at all. I, didn't either. Um, yeah. <laughs> I couldn't, I couldn't be bothered with it. Yep. And then as soon as I found a topic I was passionate about and I liked it, but I couldn't consume enough, right? Um, and I do a lot of driving. I, I mean, uh, for my full-time job, I cover properties from Nashua, New Hampshire, 
um, out to Worcester, down to Warwick, Rhode Island, and up into the city. We have a couple in Boston and Cambridge. Um, so I spend a lot of time behind the wheel, uh, a lot of a lot of windshield time, and uh, I consume a lot during that time. You know, whether it's podcasts like Bigger Pocket podcasts or audible audio books. Um, I mean, I have like 130 books in my Audible account that, I mean, God, if I went back to high school and told my teacher I'd have 130 books in my uh, Audible account, they'd be like, yeah, bull. Like, that's not going to, you are not a reader. Um, but I mean, again, it's, you know, in some of the books that I've, I've connected with, like, really well, I went ahead and bought the physical version of it because I like to have that physical, that tactile version of it so I can mark it up, touch it, uh, feel it, and uh, refer to it a lot easier because you can't really, like you said before, the the chart in uh, Millionaire Real Estate Investor, I can't pull that chart up easily on Audible, right? I have to go through a bunch of different channels to get to the PDF and all that. Um, but with the book in front of me, boom, you just flip it, it right over and it's right there. So um, yeah, you find a book you like, definitely get as many versions of it as you can and share it with the world and, you know, <laughs> have it as a reference. I mean, I got a couple of books right here. I'm still working. I see through. that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, get some good uh, ones back there. <laughs> yeah. A lot of bigger pockets ones. Yeah. You can't go wrong with the bigger pockets ones. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that and a lot of the uh, the Rich Dad ones. I mean, I've, obviously, Rich Dad, Poor Dad was a big one for me mindset wise to kind of get you into thinking like, it's amazing the light bulbs that went off as soon as I read that book. Like, I didn't know I didn't have the right mindset. Then I read that. and I'm like, holy crap, like why hasn't the world digested every ounce of this? Because they don't teach you that in school. Yeah. Um, but, you know, uh, on the heels of that, Ken McElroy does a lot of books uh, that are, are good content. Um, and he's one of the uh, rich dad advisors. So a lot of good stuff from Ken McElroy. I follow his, uh, his uh, YouTube channel as well. So, you know, some good tidbits from there. I'll have to check him out. That sounds really familiar. Was he on, yeah. um, I don't know if he was on like the Bigger Pockets podcast, maybe? Yes. Well, yeah, he cool. was. All right. I was going to say, that sounds wicked familiar. I'm like, I, I don't know. I don't think I've read any of his books. Unless was he the yeah, this is This is one of the more recent ones. Oh, right? okay. So that's, that's Ken McElroy. Oh, hey, man. <laughs> it's my buddy. <laughs> my boy, Ken. <laughs> we go way back. We go way back. Yeah, just good. It's good to have the reference. You know what I mean? But don't uh, don't bury your nose in the book too much. You know, yeah. put it out, put it in practice. Yep. That's that's huge. Yeah. Ooh. All right. I'll ask one more question for you, Dan. What sure. is your best piece of advice to new investors that want to start and manage their rental portfolio? or even just get started in general? All right, well, I've, I've said a lot of important things. Yeah. <laughs> uh, like, definitely, you don't need to know everything yourself. I'm gonna repeat that. But I would say more specifically for somebody just starting out and uh, um, and thinking about doing their own, their own portfolio and everything like that is, um, I hear this a lot because I'm trying to get like my own brother and, and my cousin who, like they like the idea of it, but they don't want to get involved with it. And it always comes down to the fear of tenants. Um, and I would say, don't like there's, there's nothing to fear. I mean, granted my rental is in Massachusetts, not a, not a landlord friendly state by any means, <laughs> yeah. but I mean, again, the, the tenants are only, you know, the tenants aren't the problem. Um, you know, there's, a lot of the books, uh, a lot of the content I've digested, it really comes down to screen them right, screen your tenants the right way and train them the right way. You know what I mean? They need to know how you operate and you need to hold the line. You know what I mean? I know you want to be friends. You know, you don't want to have conflict or anything like that. But at the end of the day, you're the landlord. You have responsibilities, you have obligations, and you need to provide them a safe place to, uh, to live and, and call their own. Um, but, you know, I hear a lot of people, I don't want to change toilets and I don't want to do that. I want to do that. It's fine. You don't have to ever touch that stuff, right? Don't let the fear of the possibility of that happening stop you from doing it. Now, granted, I've had some late night calls where it's like, oh, the water heater went out and I could call someone, sure, but I'm relatively close to the property and sometimes I run down there and deal with it, but I'm not a good property manager. I don't, I don't get enjoyment out of managing the property. Um, my wife helps with that right now. And obviously my goal is when I get more properties that I will outsource the management of it because that's not what brings me joy. That's not what I'm good at. And I would be doing my tenants a disservice by sitting in that seat and saying, I'm your property manager. Because yeah. um, I don't, I can't present that that is the, the thing that brings me joy. But 
don't, you know, don't be afraid of the tenants. Get yourself into a bigger, big enough property that when you run the numbers, it cash flows enough to get you to cover a manager. That's all. Right. So, you know, my cousin was talking about it and I mentioned to him, if you're ready and you have the FHA available, shoot for a four family. Right. If you're okay, you're young enough, you don't have to worry so much about it. You don't have a, a big family that you're, you know, don't want to live in a, an apartment, maybe. Um, you're young enough to do it. Get yourself into a four family because with the rents of a three other units, you can live in your unit, maybe pay something, maybe pay nothing at the end of the day. But with the income you get from those other three units, as long as you're getting market rate and everything else is, is you know, copacetic, you can pay for a manager to handle the headaches that would, you would lose sleep over. Yeah. So that's what I would say is just run your numbers the right way to make sure you can carry a management company and do it. I mean, you don't have to interact to that level. You can isolate yourself from that fear if that's what's really stopping you. I love that, Dan. That's golden. <laughs> So where on uh, like like social media and stuff can you be found? Like where can you be be contacted? <laughs> yeah. So um, as as you know, I'm not so uh, so <laughs> so skilled with the socials. Um, I it's do okay, have an Instagram. <laughs> uh, I have zero posts on my Instagram. I do mostly following there. Um, I don't have a lot of content to share. I, well, at least I say that. But then when I talk to people, they're like, "You have content to share," but I don't have the time to create the content really to I put it out me. there. So yeah. <laughs> um, maybe when I'm big enough, I get a social media manager, that'll all happen. But um, best place is Facebook. Um, that's the best place to reach me. Um, I am on Bigger Pockets. Uh, I'm on LinkedIn. Um, I'm on Instagram. You can try me all those different areas, but definitely to get my attention, Facebook is the, uh, the best bet. Cool, cool. Yeah, I'll, I'll link that stuff below. Thank you so, so much for coming on here, Dan. I could Thank keep you. talking to you, talking to you for. I know this for, for a is a whole time. other chapter we haven't cracked into, but yeah, this is, uh, this is great. I really appreciate you inviting me out and uh, I hope my, I've, I've added some value to your, uh, to your audience. And um, I mean, again, reach out, I'm, I'm here to talk and, and I'll, I'll add this little tidbit as well is um, if you do, if you are local to, uh, to any of the meetups that, uh, that I frequent or that are put on by the Candor group or anything like that. Uh, specifically follow those things on Facebook. And uh, I typically indicate when I'm going to be at something. And if you're, if you're like me, you're introverted, you're a little afraid to, to network or whatever. Uh, and I'm going to one of those meetings, seek me out, come find me. You know what I mean? Um, I'll be that one person you talk to. I have no problem with that. Yeah. Um, we can have a one-on-one -on -one conversation and uh, hopefully, uh, you know, keep you going in the right direction as much as I can. Of course. That's absolutely huge, Dan. But yeah, you know, thank you so, so much again, man. That was absolutely amazing. <laughs> My pleasure. All right, guys, that concludes our Creating Wealth podcast episode for today. I want to thank every single person that has listened this far. It really means a lot to know that people can learn from me and with me as we build wealth together. Hopefully you can take home at least one thing from this podcast that will improve your life just a little bit. If you could, please check me out on social. That's at Kyle Curtin Real Estate on Instagram, Facebook, and I'm on Bigger Pockets. Until next time, let's build together.